Hi everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Tina Vung. I am the Capability Building Coordinator for Connecting Up and TechSoup New Zealand. I'd like to welcome you all to the webinar Online Volunteering and How It Engages Millennials, which will pre be presented by Matthew Boyd from Volley. So we'll start with a little bit of housekeeping. All lines are muted, so if you have any questions during the session, please type it in the questions box on your webinar panel and Matt will answer them throughout the webinar. Please note that your comments and questions will not appear to the entire group. If you have any technical issues, please also type it in the questions box and I'll try my best to help you out with those. Please note that if you are on a Wi-Fi connection and have multiple programs open, this can sometimes affect the quality of the audio and video of the webinar. So if possible, please close all other programs to help you have the best experience possible today. Before we start, I'd also like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you all within a week after the webinar ends. So you'll be able to access this at any given time. So that's all from me for now. I'll pass it over to Matt to get this started. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for, for joining this webinar uh, on online volunteering and how it engages millennials. Um, so to talk a little bit about myself, uh, my name is Matthew Boyd. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Volley. Um, I am originally from London. Uh, for any of you that can uh, pick that up, English people tend to think I sound more Australian than English these days, but I'll I'll leave that to you. I've been living in Melbourne for about 10 years. Uh, I've got an honours degree in marketing from Buckinghamshire University and I've been working very closely with the non-profit sector for um, the best part of 10 years, all of the time that I've been in Melbourne. Um, I have volunteered myself. I've uh, visited the Royal Children's Hospital. I've worked with animal sanctuaries, mental health organisations, environmental groups. And you name it really, I've, I've been there as a volunteer. I've run corporate volunteering programs as well. And I'm, I've actually worked with charity organizations to help manage their volunteering. Uh, so I like to think that I've sat on um, every side of, of volunteering and understood from, from each party um, the, the positives and, and negatives even of the experience. Uh, I've been successful in raising over $2 million in, in funding and also volunteer value in my time there. So to get started, um, what does the future of volunteering hold? Well, it's, it's my opinion that the gig economy is going to play a very key role here. Uh, the gig economy, for anyone that isn't uh, clear, is the growing number of workers that are abandoning their nine to five employment and that more traditional employment in favour of working independently on a task by task basis. Now I want to open up the idea of gig, gig volunteering more. Um, the trend towards the gig economy has well and truly begun but the question is really is the non-profit sector prepared? Now in this digital age the workforce is increasingly mobile and work can be done from anywhere. Modern day professionals can select temporary jobs, while organisations can select the best individuals from a larger talent pool. But the question really beyond this is what this means for the non-profit sector. Now, digitisation and the entrance of the millennial generation into the workforce is fueling this change. And it's vital that non-profits effectively connect with millennial skill sets to support their organisation's work. So from this, I want us all to consider on-demand volunteering. Taking a closer look at the gig economy, by 2020, 40% of the US workforce uh, will be involved in the gig economy in some way. Freelance work is common in writing, consulting, design, but it's now moving much more broadly, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later in this webinar. Many workers are ditching the traditional nine to five, as I've said previously, for more flexible work. And again, I'm gonna speak more about this in detail in, uh, in, in the upcoming slides. And unemployment is really driving this demand. And if we think about that, people who have 
been made redundant and are now driving for Uber or even um, working for Deliveroo, um, just finding those more bite-sized job opportunities uh, before they find their next role, or even just uh, just to continue doing this long term, and they're able to sustain the kind of salary they'd expect from a full-time job. What's important is whatever the motivation, it is indisputable that this mode of work is rapidly growing alongside the emergence of digital freelance marketplaces. And I'll give some example, examples of these um, in later slides. So let's look more closely at Australia. The largest freelance category is web, mobile, software development. This, this may not be a surprise to some of you. Um, this accounts for around 44% of all um, gig-based work. Design and creative is uh, very popular as well. Uh, that sits around 14%. Customer and admin support, uh, sales and marketing, and also writing uh, are very popular when we're looking at the sort of freelance work. A really important stat that, that I came across is that data has revealed that 4.1 million Australians, or 32%, had freelance between 2014 and 2015. Um, now that was the most recent information I was uh, able to find. I'm sure there'll be more information coming out in the coming uh, years, but I would imagine that that 32% has rapidly grown um, even in the last three or four years. So to talk about the rise of, of the gig economy, we're speaking about brands like Uber, like Airbnb, like Airtasker. To talk a little bit more about the increasing demand, um, youth are driving this uh, to a fairly significant extent. Uh, we need to think about the, the mentality of youth in this day and age. There's this generational shift towards freedom and entrepreneurship. Uh, you've just got to look at the rise of startups right now in across Australia and certainly in major cities. I, I'm based in Melbourne and it's absolutely exploding here. Uh, and it is, it is a, that new mentality of youth to, uh, to start their own business, to, to create their own legacy in some, uh, to some extent. But older workers also want to set their own schedules. Uh, they want to choose tasks and work in an environment that suits them. This stat here from Hayes is, is really interesting. So a recent study by them showed that 55% of Australians would take a 20% salary cut in order to work from home, which is amazing when you think about it. Um, a further 22% would sacrifice 10% of their annual salary just to have more flexible working arrangements. So this really highlights the fact that people don't necessarily want to be physically going to a building to carry out their work and leave at the end of the day and be done. I suppose in this day and age, we, we all have laptops, we're able to work, whether it's from home, from our favorite coffee shop. Uh, and this is really seeping into uh, the corporate space and people wanting more flexibility. I've, I've had recent conversations with large organizations in this country, um, major banks, uh, accounting firms, and uh, consultancy organizations all of whom are actually downsizing their, their buildings right now. They're going from these great big skyscrapers into buildings half, two thirds the size. And it's because they expect fewer workers to be in these buildings uh, at any one time. And they, they're allowing their staff to, to work more flexibly and, and, and be able to carry out the work in their job um, around their own personal schedule. They're doing this not because they they want to and they've decided this is good for staff. There is a huge demand from the staff and at the end of the day, if they want to attract and retain the best talent, then they need to be able to accommodate their, their requirements. Airtasker's 2015 survey of the future of work revealed that 85% of Australians believe that the traditional nine to five office hours are inflexible. So we seem to have a slide missing here, um, and I can make sure that um, make sure that it's available when uh, when I send the presentation through. But I'll just talk to this. Well, I'll talk to a, a screen with text on it instead. That might be a bit better. Um, 
the screen there that, that you're missing is, is around why it's important. Um, this way of work offers a real sense of freedom, but it also offers real economic benefits. Um, you'll have this stat when I send through the, the slides, so don't worry too much about writing it down. But by 2025, McKinsey's supply side analysis shows that online talent platforms could raise global GDP by up to $2.7 trillion and increase employment by the equivalent of 72 million full-time positions. So you can just see how this is gonna fit in to, to the way we work in this day and age and moving forward. Um, addressing the, the slide that I'm currently on, the benefits of, um, of this more gig-based freelance work compared to traditional nine to five, um, you average 40 hours a week. So it's fast and flexible and consider that on average, it takes 2.7 days to source a freelancer versus 34 days uh, going through the traditional recruitment processes to find an employer. So in this very fast paced day and age in which we live, that as I'm sure a lot of you can uh, imagine would be uh, very appealing to businesses to find the right person that quickly, 2.7 days versus 34 days. You're able to tap into a world of talent, often through platforms like Freelancer. You're able, you need a graphic designer. They're not just based in Sydney or Australia, they're right across the world. And so that again is incredibly appealing to, to businesses. There's increased productivity, and this one's an interesting point. Um, because due to that specialized requirement and accountability of the freelancer with that one task, they have to get it right. If they get it wrong, it's gonna be very clear because it's the one thing they're responsible for. You compare that to somebody who's got a full-time job and see multiple tasks at any given time. If, if they get something wrong, it's okay, we're all human. Uh, but with this more gig-based approach to, to work, um, you're a graphic designer, we'll stick on that example, and, and so, somebody's posted a, a requirement, you need to design a logo for my organization. You need to get that right. So that's what I mean there. Um, this way of work is incredibly valuable to smaller organizations. There's no long-term commitments, costs, uh, employment contracts, insurance, all that sort of stuff. So um, really beneficial from that respect. So, Within Australia, um, the problem that we need to solve is that the current, the current volunteer rate for the youngest working generation, millennials, is only 30%, the lowest of all employed generations in Australia. And now I'm really moving from a, a, a general look at the gig economy and, and the, the future of work, the way of work and how it's shifting, and specifically looking at volunteering um, and what we can do within the nonprofit sector to more effectively engage that next generation of volunteer um, and talking more about online volunteering. So this chart that you will have in front of you uh, is uh, the current volunteering rates in Australia. And I apologize to those um, tuning in uh, from New Zealand. Uh, I recently did a bit of research uh, around the, um, the volunteering rates in New Zealand and found that it is quite similar. It's, it's shifted towards older generations. Uh, younger generations are volunteering less. So the, the stats in New Zealand wouldn't be too dissimilar, but this, this is uh, currently in Australia. And as we can see, older generations are volunteering significantly more than younger generations are. Uh, volunteering in Australia has highlighted a need to more effectively engage the next generation of volunteer and utilizing technology to do so, which speaks very well to this, this webinar that, that we're uh, currently going through. But the, uh, the, the facts are that the next generation uh, of Australians aren't volunteering as much. If we look at why, uh, and this is not just coming from secondary research, um, before we launched Volley, I, we carried out uh, a lot of focus groups, a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews, uh, a lot of surveys to really understand this. So this is coming from my own um, experience and research and also the secondary research that's available. Um, millennials won't volunteer due to a lack of flexibility with current volunteering programs. Um, there's, there's a lack of support for, for online volunteering. Um, 
millennials typically don't know where to start as well. But believe me, from, from the findings um, that we've identified, you ask 10 millennials, would you volunteer and use your skills to support a cause that you care about? And at least nine of them are gonna say yes. So the fact that one in three volunteer, one in three Australians generally volunteer is great, but we've got a huge opportunity here. We've got around 66% of Australians generally uh, and a large number of those being millennials who don't currently volunteer. Millennials still want to change the world, but they want to do it in such a way that affirms their sense of purpose. And that's a really important point. You know, we see on the news, we, we read uh, online every day, um, not exclusively, but a lot of millennials are there marching in the streets for marriage equality, um, campaigning in the US over various different political matters and right across the world. They, they want to change the world. And so it's a huge passion of mine to be able to, to more effectively engage this audience and, and channel their skills and experience and time into the nonprofit sector. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my organization just to give some context. Um, so I've launched a platform called Volley. Um, we're an online volunteering platform that connects people's skills with the needs and requirements of the nonprofit sector. What we're doing is applying the way that people volunteer to this on-demand age and this gig economy. Um, we're combating those reasons why people don't currently volunteer and why they struggle to get engaged. Um, why, what we're doing differently to traditional volunteering is making that application process really quick within four clicks so that people can easily identify opportunities and apply for them from wherever they are in the world. We're making it incredibly cost effective for nonprofit organizations and we're giving that convenience. And this is, this is something that can be applied to your organization and something that I'm very happy to discuss offline and um, my email is going to be coming up on, on the coming slides. So along with what we're doing with Volley, this isn't just saying this is what we do um, and it's just, you know, it's a stale slide. It's about saying this is what we do. This is how it's working very well. And however I can support to drive this within your organization, you know, I'd be more than happy to. Um, we've essentially built a platform that's combating combating so many of the reasons why people don't currently volunteer. Um, we're highly scalable, we're, we're tapping into a world of talent uh, and allowing all of these different peoples to be able to support your organisations. A little bit about our um, progress to date. We've been operational for 20 months. Uh, we've seen hundreds of projects go live, uh, thousands of skilled volunteering hours go through our platform and uh, we've generated over $320,000 of value to the nonprofits currently using our platform. This is essentially money that we've saved them. And the average project value on Volley is, uh, is around $900 as well, which we're incredibly, incredibly proud of. Um, we've worked with some of the biggest charity organizations in Australia. We currently work with around 500 organizations. So I'm really keen now to, to open this up to you all and um, to, to have a bit of a discussion uh, around any questions you've got with the presentation that I gave um, and any real life experiences that, that you're going through right now, any pain points, what's on your to-do list um, and really addressing how we more effectively can engage millennials and, and embrace online volunteering. So uh, I'll, I'll open it up to you now and I'll let Tina jump in and we can, uh, we can talk a little bit more from there and I look forward to seeing some questions coming through. Um, we haven't got any questions yet, but we may give it a couple of minutes. Um, here we go, a couple have come through. Um, so Marissa says, how do we know what skills are available? Sure, well, the way we work with volleys, we understand what you require first and foremost. So we'll workshop with you to understand um, what you need. Uh, we post those projects on our platform, and uh, and we find you the right people for for the um, for the requirement. So it's very much skewed towards 
um, to what you need. And uh, the, the typical sorts of skills that we will see on Volley would be uh, web development, um, IT, legal assistance, graphic design, copywriting, marketing, HR. To be honest, if we're speaking generally with online volunteering, almost any skill can be completed. Now, traditional, like, Physical volunteering, of course, there will always be a huge uh, demand for, and, and this is going back to that 33% of people that currently volunteer. Um, addressing that, and potentially people within that space will want to embrace online volunteering, but more specifically looking at the 66% that don't currently volunteer. Um, many people work for organizations uh, in different states, uh, even different countries around the world. So the possibilities with the sorts of skills that you can tap into with remote volunteering, with online volunteering, are almost endless. Um, and Catherine has asked the question off of that question just then and asked how do you actually test those skills? Yeah, well, the, the, our process is uh, skilled volunteers, they sign up to our platform, they sign up with their LinkedIn profile or they uh, self-populate their professional information. Um, so that you'll post a project and you'll start to see applications coming through and you can click on that profile and you can see all of that person's professional experience. But it's also important to understand the motivations and the, even the passions behind that individual. So there's messaging on our platform, we've set that up so you can uh, communicate with these, these skilled volunteers straight away. Uh, you can also get in touch with them uh, through Skype or, or Google Hangouts. Uh, you can send them emails, you can even call them through the platform. Uh, for, through our experience and the, those hundreds of projects that have gone live, what somebody looks like on paper is, is one thing, but the, the motivation behind why they're doing what they're doing uh, can be just as important. We've had charity organisations who have posted projects and you've got, you've got Kath and you've got Stephen who have applied for that project and they both look fantastic on paper and they're both that web developer that your organization really needs. But you get in touch with Stephen and you ask, uh, why, do you, why do you want to work with our, our organization? Stephen might just say, oh, I just want to volunteer. I just need to build up my experience. Whereas Kath might say, I love your organization. Uh, I've been following you for years. You know, I truly believe in what you do. That passion can go a long way to taking a, a completed project being okay and, and you know, substandard to being something that's absolutely exceptional. So that's the process that we take. Okay, um, David wants to know, is social media a potential platform to engage with millennials? Absolutely, and Volley uh, has a very small marketing budget and we um, we use social media and we, we spend. There, there's, a, there's a big conversation here because uh, for those of you who are aware of the Facebook algorithm changes. I was recently at a, um, a chuffed event which um, Edgar's Mission and Animal Sanctuary spoke at um, and a guy called Kyle who's um, one of the main guys behind uh, Edgar's Mission uh, spoke a lot about how negatively um, the Facebook algorithm changes have affected their reach and their engagement. Um, they used to get thousands, if not tens of thousands of likes and responses and click-throughs and now it's down to a few hundred and they're not doing anything differently. Now, despite this, it is still a very powerful tool. Um, you should be looking at um, Facebook just as a standard. They've built themselves up to be um, almost as essential as the internet itself. Um, what will change in the future, we will see, is they're going to be a big uh, disruptive um, social networks come out of Silicon Valley in the next five to ten years. I would very much bet that there's some people working on it. How you knock uh, Facebook off of their throne, I'm not sure. But look, regardless, Facebook is there. It's incredibly in uh, effective in terms of engaging our audience. We have thousands of people signed up. We have dozens of people signing up to Volley every day, and it's through Facebook. Um, we do spend the algorithm and the changes have been put in place that they say it's so that in your newsfeed you're more likely to see friends, family and groups. It's my opinion that that doesn't seem completely accurate because 
at the end of the day on Facebook now, you do need to spend. Um, now, we don't spend any more than 5 or $10 a day promoting our content, our organizations as well. We put our charities at the forefront, but that does get the engagement. Um, so, yeah, sorry, long-winded answer. Um, it's, it's a subject I'm very passionate about. Hopefully, um, you are all as well. Um, it's frustrating right now. Um, you, speak, you hear from businesses that use Facebook 10 years ago and it helped them generate hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of sales or donations. It's changed and it's become very tricky and it works in such a way now where you've got to spend money to make money. Um, but it's, um, it's still quite a powerful tool. Beyond Facebook, Instagram is incredibly important. LinkedIn, if you want to be engaging that corporate audience and Twitter just for sharing news and so forth. Um, when we get into the, the likes of Snapchat and all that sort of stuff, I've just turned 34. I feel far too old for all that sort of stuff. Um, it's not typically the sort of audience that we're engaging anyway. Gen Z are very much on Snapchat. It's something we'll probably need to consider in the future. Okay, um, Sophia has asked if there are any fees associated with using the volley services. <laughs> So we, we charge a small fee per completed project. Um, for one completed project, it's $49. For three uh, projects, it's $99. And a value pack of five is $149. Um, we are, we're not a job board. We're an end-to-end -end service. We, um, we workshop with you around your requirements to help you get those projects posted. We actively connect you with someone exceptional for that project, and we stay with you until that project's completed. Um, there are certain job boards out there that, that would charge the prices we charge or sometimes double or three times just to post that opportunity. But I understand and the volley team understands that there are so many pitfalls with the volunteering process. Um, volunteers dropping off, charities not always clearly articulating their requirements. And as a result, so many hours are wasted and, and money is wasted at the end of the day. So those are the fees involved. We are a certified B Corp, we're a business for good, but um, of course we need to be sustainable and, and cover our time. Um, I hope you agree that they're very cost effective prices um, and considering that stat that I showed earlier where each project on, VAT, on, on Volley um, saves our organisations uh, a little over $900. If we're building you a new website, which we can do with a project, it's going to be significantly more. But yeah, we're a social business that ensure that we're sustainable and um, you know, for every dollar you spend, you see around $20 in return. So we, we think that's pretty good. Sophia says it sounds very worthwhile. So um, yes. off the back of that, Charlotte has asked, if you purchase three projects, how long do you have to use or complete them? There's no use by date. There's no sign up fees or anything like that to volley. They're the costs. Um, so some organizations purchase three projects and post them straight away. Uh, other organizations purchase three, um, post one within the first week, have the other two sitting in the bank just for as and when they need them. Obviously, the more you buy, um, the, uh, the cheaper that cost is. You buy a value pack of five and that cost comes down to around $29. So that's, um, that's what I like to promote. And uh, yeah, there's, there's no... Um, there's no you know, use by dates or anything like that. So um, lots of flexibility. Great. Um, Eva has asked if Volley is also available for New Zealand charities. Absolutely. Yeah, we're, um, we're, we're keen to start um, working with, with uh, charities based in New Zealand, Eva. Um, so yeah, 100%. And to give you a little bit of an idea of the landscape of the sorts of organisations we work with, we work with around 500, mostly in Australia. We're working with a few organisations um, in Africa, um, a youth organisation in Kenya, uh, and a youth organisation in Uganda. We work with a few um, organisations out of California. We've just aligned with an animal welfare group in Toronto. We're working with a few in South America. Um, few in Singapore, uh, a couple of organizations in Nepal, and uh, just yesterday we had a Thai uh, organization which is actually combating sex trafficking, um, a very intense and, and, and dark subject um, which they are tackling head on. 
uh, and um, requiring a, a number of different things. They, they need uh, an app developed, they need a, a new social media strategy and a few other things. So we're naturally progressing overseas and, and the New Zealand market is, is one that we, we really want to um, start engaging. So yeah, looking forward to, to working with New Zealand organisations. Right. Um, Catherine has made a comment um, that one of the challenges that she faces is a high turnover with volunteers. Um, yep. Do you have anything to suggest to that? Yeah, well, the high turnover, in my opinion, and, and certainly speaking to the millennial audience, is, is due to uh, perhaps, and, and not making a comment about your organisation, but as, as a generalisation, opportunities not being uh, flexible enough. And um, the she's the sport... added to that comment as well oh, yeah. and said that um, the turnover is due to them moving into the workforce. Okay, all right. Um, the so could I get an idea of the the typical age group there? Um, some of the ones that move on to part time about twenty years. Yeah. Old. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so to give you an idea, so and and again, I'm I'm speaking about my experience because um, you know, it's it's based on facts and the development of of what we've done. Wally's audience are made up 50% of 25 to 34 year olds. Um, from that previous um bar graph I showed, they're the least likely working generation to to volunteer in Australia, and it's not too dissimilar in New Zealand. So we're effectively engaging these people who are in full-time work, and, and that says a lot. So project-based opportunities that can be carried out from anywhere essentially mean that, that people can be in full-time employment and be carrying out these, um, these requirements for your organisation. Uh, the average project that we see coming through is around 20 hours uh, and is completed within four weeks. So that's asking four hours a week, uh, sorry, five hours a week of somebody which is absolutely doable. Um, so to, to really answer that question, I think that online volunteering can combat um, that issue. Um, 35 to, um, to 44 year olds account for 35% of our audience. Uh, again, a, 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 an audience that are very much in the workforce and um, um, you know would struggle for time typically. So. Yeah, I think I think online volunteering. I think breaking down your requirements into project-based opportunities uh, is is a really effective way of engaging these people. What we see through Volley as well, and this is a psychological thing, people will complete a project and then start applying for more. We've got we've had a lot of people who have um, applied and some who have completed at least two projects on Volley. We've had some people who have completed four or five. So. Again, I suppose it's managing expectations. If you say to somebody, would you mind spending 20 hours over the next month and just, just updating our website? And they do. And then that next requirement is, um, actually, we want to build a, a basic app um, to, to communicate with our volunteers. And that same person might be like, oh, yeah, OK, I've got, I've got some more time now as well. So I think these bite-sized opportunities in online volunteering can certainly combat that. Thanks, Matt. Um, Penelope has asked, can you offer advice about maintaining privacy when using online volunteers to work on a project? For example, proofreading sensitive material. Absolutely. Um, now, what we've done is we've got um, some very thorough terms and conditions and privacy policy around how uh, volunteers utilise the platform. Um, this is us, um, but just speaking generally as well for, for considerations. Um, privacy is incredibly important around data. Um, anybody who's accessing your data has to agree to the sorts of terms and conditions and privacy policy that means that if they misuse your data in any way whatsoever, it can be legally enforceable. It can and will be legally enforceable. Um, we also consider things like intellectual property. So somebody produces something for you, somebody produces uh, an animation video for your organization and at the end of the day they want to uh, claim that as their own and they want to use that in the future which isn't fair it's yours and it's been created for your organization so the intellectual property of all work produced 
must be yours, the, the charity organisation. Uh, also in terms of privacy, just sharing of um, uh, a marketing strategy or a fundraising strategy which could help your organisation to generate tens of thousands of dollars if not more. That's yours and that's a fairly private document which, which you want to keep private. So the privacy that comes in around that just means that people can't add that work experience to their portfolio or their LinkedIn or their or their CV. So there are a few really key points that, that we highlight um, to ensure that people use our service um, in the way as is intended. Right. Um, so that's it for questions. We haven't had any other ones come through. Um, sure. So was there anything else you wanted to add um, Matt, before I finish off the session? No, no, I mean, my, my email address is there. I'm, I'm more than happy to, to speak to any organisations afterwards, of course, any any organisations that are interested in utilising Volley, um, but even if it's just how to effectively um, run different areas of your organisation more efficiently, um, more than happy to. So so my email address is there, it's nice and simple, it's matt at volley.com.au. Uh, so, yeah, really appreciate everyone tuning in and um, hopefully look forward to, to hearing from you in the coming days. Thanks, Matt. Um, so thank you very much, um, Matt, for presenting today and thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you've all learnt a lot from this presentation and that all your questions have been answered. If you do have any questions that come to mind later on or any feedback about this webinar, um, please feel free to send that through to events at connectingup.org and we can answer those questions offline. Um, as Matt said, you can also contact him directly via the information on your screen and in your webinar control panel. So don't forget that this is um, being recorded and we'll send you all a recording out in the next few days um, via email. So keep an eye out on your inbox. Again, thank you for being with us. Enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thanks everyone.